Please welcome our next speaker, uh, Mr. Greg Hain. Good morning. I think there's a better way for us to work. Actually, I think there's a much better way. More importantly, though, I believe every single one of you sitting here today believes that, too. Even the most jaded roofing contractor, someone that would never dream of coming to something like Best of Success, gets up regularly and says, man, there's got to be a better way. Well, there is. And I'd like for you to look at the ideas I'm going to be sharing with you today as a path that you can begin to walk down. So as I was preparing this talk, I got to thinking about this, and I said, you know, let's see. Talking about a better way to work, ooh, that sounds kind of good, doesn't it? And then let's see um, a path to walk down. And by the way, as you're going to see, this is a proven path that people are already going down, and that sounds pretty good, too. It also makes me sound like a little bit like a late-night televangelist or a politician. So I understood that one of the things I needed to do was to find a way to make this very real, very practical, and very specific for each and every one of you, so we are going to start with a workshop. I want everybody to turn to page 21 in their book, if you've not already turned there yet, and at the top it says multiply 269 by the number of employees you had at the end of last year. Do that now. When you find out what this number is, if you've not done the math, you're going to do the math immediately. Then, after you finish that, you're allowed to use your phones as calculators if you've forgotten how to multiply. Then I want you to make a list of at least three initiatives, things that could make a real difference in your company that you have already thought of, but you haven't been able to get them done yet. Maybe you were at Best of Success last year. You heard a great presentation. You say, oh, man, if I would do that, it would make a, it'd make a difference in my company, and it would but you didn't get it done. Put it on the list. Maybe you're a commercial contractor and you, say, and you decided that you want to move from uh, doing so much new construction to more re-roofing, but you look at your percentages over the last three or four years, they haven't changed. You're not getting it done. Put it on the list. Right, right, right now. To the degree that you invest in this, you'll get value for this. I am going to help you today with everything that goes on that list. Okay, if you got come up with more than three, write four, write five. Think big. Write legibly so that you can take whatever these notes are and you can go back to your office and share it with your business partner or spouse and they can read the words. I don't need paragraphs. It's enough to say more re-roofing, less new construction. But you have to have enough words that six months from now you know what you're talking about. As you're writing, I'm going to continue to talk. Some of you know me, and I know some of you. If there's a better ways to work, that means that sometimes what we're doing isn't all that resourceful. I have a couple of stories I'm going to share. Some of you are going to be sitting there going, oh, he's talking about me. And that actually may be true, but I'm probably talking about a person sitting on either side of you. The examples I've got to share here today are pretty much, as far as I'm concerned, endemic within our industry. So I'm not violating any confidences. Also, I'm going to be referring to a variety of things today, and when you go to the Best of Success website and download the presentations, if you choose to download mine, at the end of my presentation is a series of reference materials that come off, and it's long enough that it actually has a table of contents. About another minute. Right, 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 right. Okay, I'm going to suggest that you might want to have other things that you're going to put on this list before the weekend is over, or the, the, the day is over. So if you flip the page to where it says notes, you might put notes there. I have a couple initiatives you might want to add before I'm finished today. But for me to stand up here and say that our world has changed is to be wasting all of our time. We all know that the world is changing. That change is going to continue and actually it's going to accelerate. How are you going to keep up? Most of you are already having trouble keeping up. My image is that we're all kind of like in this big pond of water, and the water keeps coming up, and we're starting to get up on our toes and our noses going like this, and pretty soon we're all going to be treading water, and some of us feel like we're doing that already. So one thing I could do is talk about different ways to tread water. I'm not going to do that because that's dealing with a symptom. I think what we need to do is deal with the problem. 
I think we need to make, go, go make friends with the guy that's controlling the valve that's dumping the water in the pond. What's his name? Now, the reality is there is no guy, but there is a valve, and it does have a name, and you can make friends with it. It's called our knowledge-based economy. The economy that we are in today is not the same as the economy that we were in 20 years ago, and it's not going back. I ran into an article a couple years ago written by Michael McAbee and Tim Scudder. You have the entire article in the reference links entitled Strategic Intelligence, a Conceptual Leadership System of Leadership for Change. Completely changed the way I thought about my business. It can do the same for you. In there, he has a table in which he talks about the different eras of work that we have had in our country. This is the table. So we have farm craft, industrial bureaucratic, and knowledge interactive. And he has ideas, uh, social characteristics, and economic considerations. And he talks about how we go from one era to the next day change. Guys, all of your businesses probably were started or, or set up this way. The world is working this way now. So, <clears throat> farm craft started in the 1850s, it was up into the 1850s, and it's called farm craft because basically there were no companies. There were farms and there were small personal businesses like the blacksmith. If there were companies, they were not the predominant form of commerce. In the 1850s, that changed, and we got into what became the Industrial Revolution, and that went up into the mid-1990s. It's called that because we had the Industrial Revolution, and large companies came into being, and the production of goods and assembly lines and so forth and so on became the predominant ways of doing business. In the 1990s, that changed. In the 1990s, there was a shift and Peter Drucker is the person that put the label knowledge-based economy on it. I've also heard, heard it called the service-based economy and the um, information age. But the idea is, in our world today, there are more organizations involved in commerce around information than there are in hard goods. Now, you're sitting there going, if you haven't done this yet, you will, if I keep going. So you're going, like, yeah, well, why should I care? Well, here's why you should care. For those of you that took the time to do the math problem, go back to wherever you did that and put three zeros behind that number. So that really what you did was you take 269,000 times the number of employees you had at the end of last year. I want you to show hands. Is there anybody in here that had sales last year greater than that number? I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, there's a hand there. I've seen one hand, that's about what I thought, okay? So in other words, virtually none of you had sales of $269,000 per employee. I did some research on knowledge-based economy companies. And I did a little, I looked at a number of them, I did some financial analysis, and I came up with some interesting information about one of them I picked out. At the end of last year, they had two, they had produced $269,000 in net profit per employee. There are companies out there that generate more money in net profit per employee than our whole industry does in terms of sales. That ought to get your attention. This should too. You can do this too. Or you can start to. I want to see a show of hands. How many of you are already using database software to manage roofing assets? Keep your hands up. Okay, fine. Good. For the rest of you, you're behind the times. Sorry. You can't do this yet. Now, fortunately, you can begin to do it. So the guy, what, what we're talking about here is software that you can go out and purchase, and every time you go out and do a repair, they take the pictures. It automatically goes into a work order, order folder back in the office. They could literally push a button when they're on the roof and send the invoice, and some of the software is set up that they can actually do that. Whether it's a wise idea or not remains to be seen, but, but the technology is there that you can do that. The reason most of you that have done this did this is because you said, man, if we get all this data about these people on our computers, you know, 
we'll have, we're going to have our, they're going to be captive to us. It's a great idea. It's probably true. My experience as a roof consultant is that you guys, as a general rule, are doing a horrible job of it. You've used this software to get better. Nothing wrong with that. You've become more efficient. But you're truly not giving people better service. I'm going to show you how to do that. So, I got two examples I'm going to share with you. I've written a white paper that all of you are welcome to, and all you have to do to get the white paper from me is take your calling card, put your name on, just got the name on, turn it over and write the words white paper on it and give it to me before the end of the day today. And I'll see that you get this. I've got the two examples on here. I got more on there. I fleshed these out more, but it's the beginning of how you can begin to go about doing this. Example number one, prospect. You're sitting down in front of a new customer, someone that you've never worked with before. You want to get their business. So you're, you're having the conversation. As you're having the conversation, it come, turns out that, you know, you ask who his main roofer is, and he tells you who the roofer is, and you happen to know who the guy is. He's actually a really good competitor of yours. In fact, although you would never say this out loud, he's better than you. How are you going to get the business? What are you going to do? Cut your price? Oh, how original. Okay. So let's try this differently. You sit down, you're having this conversation, and because you have the data, and by the way, for those of you that have the software, don't ask me about collecting the data. I'll show you that in a minute. Just, just follow along. So you, you, set, you find out who the roofer is. Oh, he's a fine roofer. You know, it's just, what I found is that there's an easy way for us to begin to compare how we can bring you value What's your recovery rate on invoices? Now, I want to see a show of hands. How many people here know what I'm talking about? I'm seeing hands. Good. If I had a room full of property managers, probably all the hands would go up. For those of you that don't understand, recovery is the portion of your invoice that your customers get to pass along to others to pay. So you go up and do a repair on a shopping center, and you walk up there, and you pull the door off the HVAC unit, and it's a popsicle inside, and it's dripping down inside. You can't fix that. So we put the door back on, and you turn around and send a bill to the, to the, uh, the, the property manager for 450 bucks, and then he turns around, and he sends a little letter to his tenant and says, the HVAC equipment is your responsibility. Here's the $450, and they pay him, and he recovers your invoice. You now become free. So you say to them, when we go up on a roof and do repairs, we categorize the repairs that we make. For instance, if we find the popsicle, we note it as such. If we go up on the roof and find punctures, we indicate that it's a puncture, there's punctures. If those punctures are close enough to the HVAC equipment that we know that when we pulled, the guy pulled the door off and set it down, he punched a hole in the roof, that's a recoverable type of expense for most knowledgeable property managers. We'll note that on the invoice. If it's age-related, we'll do that as well. If it shows lack of maintenance, we note that. We'll do, we, we categorize these things. And then we have our computer runoff reports for us. And last year, what we figured out was that we invoice people X amount of dollars, and 38% of that was recoverable. I'm just curious, how much did your roofer recover for you? Do you think this might get somebody's attention? I can guarantee you that it's almost impossible that any, that, that I'm aware of, I'm not aware of a single contractor in the country that is actively doing this on behalf. I have an owner that is on track to recover $100,000 this year. Because our roofers go out, the ones that my clients use, and they document well, we make sure they do, they, they indicate these sorts of things to us, or we discern them from them, off the invoices. Do you think this might help you get the work? Do you think this might help this conversation about, oh, what's your hourly rate, become less important? When they, maybe you're gonna give them back $38,000 on $100,000 worth of invoices? This is how you leverage data. An existing customer. Okay, let's talk about how to get more work out of them. We have a shopping center in honor of this place. I've called it Wigwam Commons. You call the asset manager on the phone. And by the way, if he's calling you on the phone, you failed. Because you've got his data. You should know more about what's going on because he never gets up on that roof. You guys do. You call him on the phone, I need to talk with you. You go sit down and you say, are you aware that so far this year we spent $12,000 at Wigwam? And maybe he is and maybe he isn't. 
You go, okay. So then you say, you know, when we go up on a roof, we, we categorize repairs, and you go through that spiel I just went through. But one of the points you emphasize is, and then when we go up on the roof, and we find things that show lack of maintenance, such as pitch pans that need to be filled, storm collars need to be caulked, caulking on termination bars, gutter splices that are leaking, so forth and so on that you send us out there for. We note that on the invoice. And what we have noticed, because we had our computer print this stuff out for us, is that so far this year, two of every three dollars you've spent on this roof has been for, for things that could lend them maintenance. Are you, a, are you aware that earlier this year we gave you a proposal for $3,800 to do all that? Now, and he probably isn't, he probably forgot, but you know, if you had paid that, you would have saved $4,200 so far. Now, the, the, the year's not over yet. You think this will get their attention? Would you like to see, sir, would you like to see how we can help you with this on other properties? Now, for those of you that don't care much about service, doing repair work is generally speaking more profitable than doing on uh, percentage basis than doing new roofs, but doing preventative maintenance is way more profitable than just fixing leaks. So these are two examples. If you want to have this, these fleshed out again and have others, I've got others, just give me your calling card with the white paper on the back. I'll be glad to do that. So how do you collect this data? Well, first of all, you don't do this in the office. I actually have a contractor that's starting to do this. He went through and did it by hand. It took him, I was having breakfast with him this morning. He's sitting back there. And he said, that all in all, it took him about eight hours to do this on one shopping center over five years. Yeah, you can't do that. The computer can. So when you go out in the field, you have a field app. And on the field app, you're going to have to have some sort of a checklist. Kind of looks like this. Now, I pick these categories simply because these categories fit what we've just talked about, but if you read the white paper, there's a few more categories. Right? So punctures near equipment, punctures not near equipment. Why? Because if they're near equipment, they're recoverable. Age-related or other non-roof leaks, recoverable often, so forth. So, an example. You caught two rain collars. Okay, the, guy, the, the, the tech goes up there, he puts a two right there, puts zeros there, he's done. Takes two seconds. Another example. An HVAC door fell off and made a hole in the roof. Well, you're up there because it rained and the water is pouring in because the door was off, so you put the door back on. Okay, that's a one. And you nick the roof, so you put a patch on there, that's near the equipment, that's one. That's how you collect data. Now, there's lots of different software out there. And I know that there's one system out there now that already does this, it's already set up. I talked with another vendor this morning who's here. He came up to me, he said, Greg, I know what you're gonna be talking about, and he said, we will write this. More on the knowledge-based economy. Now that I have your attention on the money side, understand that the knowledge-based economy that we're in is not just about money and information. It reflects a way of thinking that's different. So going back to this, I'm going to take just this one area right there, and I'm going to talk with you about it for a couple minutes to give you an example of how a knowledge-based business would look at these issues differently. So in farm craft era, we had family loyalty. When the Industrial Revolution came along, we developed this idea of having organizational loyalty, and that's what you guys all want. You have somebody that's good, you don't want them to leave. Well, that's changed, as you may have noticed today, especially young people, but, they, but this is the case with many. They consider themselves free agents. And as Maccabee says in the article, he said, when people come to work for you now, they look at you as a place to get trained up for their next job. And you don't like that. I get that. But you don't like that because that's coming out of this of mindset. I want to share with you what the mindset is of, a, of somebody that operates from there. You need to embrace this. This is a good thing. You need to use this to your advantage. How would you do that? So you've got somebody that's come to you. They've worked, they, they came to you out of high school. They've worked their way up there now. Vice president in your company. Hey, I decided I'm going to go into business for myself. He's probably going to take a couple of your godlies with him, isn't he? What happens? Now, 
Some of you, because I know this has happened, some of you get mad. You feel betrayed. You've, you've, you've taught him everything you know, and you have. Okay? For him to do that, and there's this very heated conversation that ensues, and he leaves unhappy, you're unhappy, there's profanity involved and all that kind of stuff, and you fire him on the spot. I'm going to suggest there's a better way. I know of a couple contractors in different parts of the country that already do this. When somebody leaves, they help him. They say, um, we got an extra, we got a 40 square job here, a 30 square job here, you do it. Need a longer ladder? Come get it. If the guy's been doing a bunch of EPDM work and the job that you just dropped in his lap is a TPO job, if you've got the generator and the walker and the handguns out there not being used, you give it to him and you let him take them. And you don't charge him rent. You do everything you can to help him succeed. Now most of them are going to fail, aren't they? And when that happens, guess what happens? Guess where they want to go to work? They want to go back to work for you. And when they do, they're a much better employee because now they've been on the other side of the desk and they know your problems, okay? Now some of them don't. Some of them may turn into be competitors of yours. I have news for you. They were going to do that anyway, whether you helped them or not. So why not help the guy, help him succeed and have a friend in the industry than have somebody that hates your guts or you hate his? Somebody comes to you and says, hey, giving you my two weeks notice, I'm going to go work for your competitor down the street. Now, what most of you do when this happens is you try to talk them out of it. You ought to. And sometimes you're able to do that. They want a little more money, they want a little of this or a little of that, and you make it happen. But sometimes you do that and you walk into the office two weeks later and their phone and their keys are sitting on their desk and they're gone. You've had that happen to you too. They can't come back now, can they? I say this politely, but that's your fault. I'm going to suggest there's a better way to do this. They come to you and they say, hey, I want to leave. I'm going to go down to work for your, 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 the competitor down the street. And you say, fine. If you want to go, that's fine. I'll, I don't want to lose you. Before you go, can we have a little conversation about this? And at the end of the conversation, if you still want to leave, that's fine. And I will call your new boss on the phone, tell him what a great employee you have been, that he darn well better take good care of you, because if he doesn't, you want to come back to work for me. If I have a place for you, I'll put you back to work tomorrow. Is that fair enough? Now, that takes all the pressure off, doesn't it? So then you say, why do you want to leave? Then you <clears throat> shut up and you let them talk. And whether they want to talk for five minutes or five hours, you just let them go. Then you get five minutes. And after five minutes, what's it going to be? And then if they say, I'm going to go, you let them go. And you make that call. Now, here's the thing. What do you think is going to happen after this has happened two or three times? The word is going to get on the street. Now, I don't have any evidence to support this yet because I haven't seen any of you doing this yet. But I, I think that long term, you're going to have more people walking in the door walking, wanting to come to work for you than walk out, and they're probably going to be better people. And that's simply because you're handling this in a more expansive way. You guys need to stop comparing yourself to your competitors because if you do, you'll never get much more than incrementally, incrementally better than them. You need to start comparing yourselves to the very best, most responsive, most innovative companies in the country. Companies like Telsa Motors, Walby Parker, Microsoft, Google, Apple, people like that. Look at how those companies are run and run your company that way. For instance, if you're a large company, 200 people in one location, you need daycare. Now, most of you are sitting there going, oh, this guy's now, he's really lost his mind. Think about this, though. Your workers come to work, they bring their kids along with them, they drop them off, they get tied up on a tear-off for an extra hour and a half, rather than come tearing back to the yard, probably speeding, and then racing off to the daycare before it closes and having all that stress, they just pick their kids up and take them home. And then your competitor, the guy that sits three seats away from you here, he, he calls one of them on the phone and says, hey, you want to come to work for me? I'll give you a couple bucks more an hour. They say, do you have daycare, sir? Now he's got a dilemma, doesn't he? Okay, what's the wife going to say? Well, I'd like to have the extra money, but how are we going to handle the daycare? And what are those kids going to do when they turn 18 and they don't want to go on to get an advanced degree? Where do you think they're going to want to go to work? Now, 
what the, the, the notable company in our country today that does this sort of thing is Google. And I've heard people actually say to me, well, the reason Google does this is because they make all that money. No, 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 no. I, I was in a meeting last night. I heard a bunch of contractors talk about labor shortages that was referred to here today. They have huge tech shortages out on the West Coast. Huge tech shortages. Google does this because they want to create an environment where people are going to want to go to work. They do this to attract the best people, and they get them. You can do this too. This is an attitude. The best example, so before I get the best example, I've just talked about this right here. I could talk about any one of these and give you examples about how roofers think about it and how or many roofers think about it and how a knowledge-based company thinks about it and the distinctions. Because virtually all of these things that you can do too. The best way I know for you to get inside the mindset of these companies is to read a book. It's called How Google Works. It's by Eric Schmidt and Jonathan Rosenberg, who are Google employees. Eric Schmidt came to work. This is a remarkable book. Eric Schmidt came to work for Google in um, 2001 as chief executive officer. He's now vice chairman. I'm actually going to read an excerpt from, you, for, from it for you in just a second. I hope I read it better than I said that. But this will begin to get about how to think about your business differently. Moving on. Now, I promised you that, that I was going to give you help on the items that you put down on those initiatives that you've not got, gotten to. And by the way, I hope that you've added something to that list, like get data to leverage or leverage my data. I've got something else for you. If you've not been able to get those things done on that list so far, the title of this presentation is you want me to do what? I want you to get a coach. Reading from Google's book. In the summer of 2002, when Eric had been on the job as Google's CEO for about a year, he wrote a self-review of his performance and shared it with his team. He did what? He, re he wrote a self-review of his performance and shared it with his team. How many of you sit down and critique yourself and share it with the people you review? Hmm. The document included highlights, objectives for next year, and areas where things could have been better. The last category included several points, but the one self-critique stands out as the most important. Bill Campbell has been very helpful in coaching all of us. In hindsight, his role was needed from the beginning. I should have encouraged this structure sooner, ideally the moment I started at Google. This was a 180-degree turnaround from a year earlier when Eric started at Google. Board member John Doerr suggested that he work with Bill as his coach. Eric's reply, I don't need a coach. I know what I'm doing. Whenever you watch a world-class athlete perform, you can be sure that's a great coach behind their success. It's not that the coach is better at playing the sport than the player. In fact, that is almost never the case. But the coaches have a different skill. They can observe players in action and tell them how to be better. So why is it that in the business world, coaches are so unusual? Are we all so like Eric when he started at Google, so confident of ourselves that we can't imagine someone helping us to be better? If so, this is a fallacy. As a business leader, you need a coach. I grew up in Ohio. I graduated from Purdue, but I lived in Columbus for a while. I like to follow the Buckeyes. In 2010, the Ohio State Buckeyes under Jim Trussell went 12-1. and and then as some of you may remember, there was the problem with tattoos and things, and he lost his job. But he'd already done his recruiting. They brought in a very capable guy that had been in Ohio State by the name of Luke Fickle, and what did he do the next year in 2011? He went six and seven with the same players. So the next year they went out and they got this other guy, what was his name, Urban Meyer? He went 12 and 0. No, coaches don't make a difference. In the time I have remaining, oh, I'm doing well. I want to talk with you about coaching. I got involved in coaching because, as was mentioned when I was introduced, I've developed a training program to help roofing contractors build more profitable uh, service departments and provide their customers with better service. And when I do that, I don't just walk in and train for a day and tell you what to do, I provide support for at least a year. And that's where we implement. And oftentimes when we're trying to implement something, I say, well, do that. 
okay, and that we can make it happen. But sometimes I don't know how to make these things. You guys are all different in how you run your businesses, and that's okay. And so knowing how to implement certain things, sometimes that's where coaching skills came in. I decided I needed to get some, some help with coaching, and so I went out in October of last year, and I got trained in Atlanta to be a coach. Now, I went to a program that was run by and one of the co-authors of the training manual that's a personal friend of mine. So it was natural for me to go there. But the thing that was unusual about this is that this particular training organization specializes in training pastors to be coaches. So I was in a training program with 13 other people, all of whom were United Methodist ministers. Interesting experience. But in the manual, there's information about return on investment. Public Personal Management Journal did a study, and they discovered that when you train management people, productivity goes up 22%. But when you couple it with coaching, it goes up 88%. Now, my experience? No, nah, not quite. But there's, there's another shoe to drop on this. In 2001, a study by Manchester Inc. on executive coaching showed a return on investment of 5.7 times the initial cost. And in my opinion, oops, wrong button, that is way understated. When you go to the top of an organization, you make a change, it can filter down all throughout everything. And because I was in a training where pastors were, they had statistics on church planters. Church planting is when a denomination wants to put a church in a new geographic area where they don't have one. The people they send to do this are their best and their brightest pastors. Their success rate typically is 30 to 50 percent. But they discovered that when they couple it with, with, with coaching, it goes up to 80 to 90 percent. Now you look at that list that you, hopefully you made for me earlier. Would you rather have 30% or 90% success with that? There's a lot of people, coaching is a buzzword. There's a lot of people running around telling them that people they're coaches and that aren't. Coaching isn't mentoring, consulting, or training. If somebody walks in and tells you what to do, they aren't coaching, they're consulting or they're training. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But understand, if somebody's walking in and telling you what to do, they are not coaching you. Good coaching is based on an assumption that you are fundamentally creative, resourceful, or, or whole, and whole. And the way I like to say it is, you already have the resources you need to get everything done on that list. Now, you may not have the answers, but you'll have the ability to figure that out, and a coach can help you with that. Coaching is a process. It involves discovery, expanding possibilities. When I ask you to make a list, that's discovery. When I'm suggesting to you that not only can you do what's on that list, you can do all of it. That's expanding possibilities. It involves action and calculated risk taking. There's two other things that it is, it are involved. One is support and the other is accountability. Accountability is not the coach walking in and say, hey, how come you don't have that done? The coach, if he's a good coach, he does not hold you responsible. He'll hold up a mirror and you'll hold yourself responsible. One of the things, though, that I have discovered in being coached, because I have a coach, and on those I have coached, is that one of the big pieces is support. I have a contractor who has a fine service department, and he brought me in to train him anyway. I went and trained him earlier this year, and then I worked with him after that. He had coaching sessions, and sometimes it's consulting, and sometimes it's coaching, sometimes it's all kind of wrapped up. But at one point he said to me, he said, Greg, the training was great, but he said the reality is this one-on-one -on -one is what's really valuable to me. He says, I got nobody to talk to. I'm sure he's the only person in the room that feels that way. Who should get coaching? You. If some of you are sitting there, oh, man, I got this guy back at the bed, and boy, he could, no, 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 no. By the time you spend the the energy, effort, money, resources to train him, to make him better, if you apply that same amount of energy, effort, resources to you, you'll have a far greater effect. You and other key leaders. Coaching does not need to be face-to-face. -face. The coach does not need to walk into your office, which means if you're out in the boonies someplace, 
you know, on the East Coast and you find a good coach in the West Coast, fine, use them. With the contractors I work with, um, I use video chat because I think it enhances that, but there's some very fine coaches out there and they just do it on the phone. Absolutely works. They do not need to know anything about roofing. Now, one of the advantages I have when I work with a contractor is I actually do understand the problems, and that sometimes is also a problem. So there's an advantage to you in having someone that doesn't know roofing. <clears throat> um, my first coach, who I did not meet until after my coaching work with him was done, was a human resources director for a large regional grocery chain. And then my current coach is a United Methodist pastor in North Carolina. Neither one of them knows diddly about roofing. How to find a coach. The International Coaching Federation is kind of like the NRCA, except as a global, global organization. Their IRE this year is in London. That's their website. I'm suggesting that you look for people that have credentials that say ACC, PCC, or MCC. These people had to take tests. I'm working toward that. I don't have that yet. Something to ponder. If I had had the opportunity to sit down with each of you after we did that little workshop and you made that list of initiatives that you'd not been able to get done yet, and I said to you, okay, well, why don't you have these done? Virtually all of you are going to say, oh, I don't have the time to get to this, or I don't have the money. Sorry. No. The reality is, if we went two years into the future, and these things were all done, and I sat down with you and say, okay, what changed that caused these things to happen? None of you are going to say to me, well, I found an extra month. None of you are going to say, I found a pot of money on my desk one day. None of you are going to talk about time or money. It's always going to be something else. Something else changed. What would that be? Yes. So in my experience with being coached, the answer I will get from most of you is, what changed was you. Now, so ponder this. Often, I've, I've given you a path to walk down called the knowledge-based economy. I've given you some resources that you can download later to learn more about it. I've given you some tools to use. I've hopefully incentivized it enough for you that you've got, I've got your attention on that. These are things you can add. I find, though, that often what makes the most progress for me is the things that I take away. Not what I do, but what I don't do. So, look, going ahead two years, everything on that list is done. What is it that you didn't do? What is it that you gave up? What was it that you let go of? What changed everything? I have time for questions if this timer is correct. I'm going to start with the questions. How many of you learned something today? Good. I want to see another show of hands, and I'd like, to ha I'd like for the hands to stay up for a minute. Who here has had formal coaching? Keep your hands up for those of you that had coaches. Everybody else look around, and as, when we go to break, find one of these people and talk to them about it. See if it's made a difference in their organizations. Uh, Greg, Jack Scallo, Burns and Scallo Roofing. Two questions, two pronged. Uh, one, what do you pay your coach? And two, uh, have, do you have any experience with a board of directors or a board of advisors that actually serves as a coach, not just to you, but to key members of your organization that, that have to report to, the, to that board of advisors? Jack, I don't understand the second half of the question. The second part is, is a different form of a coach, which is a board. It's not an individual coach, but it's a, it would be a, a group or like a board of directors or a board of advisors. Okay, fine. Okay, I'll speak to that. Thank you. You get what you pay for. You can pay $100 for a coach for an hour. You can spend $3,500 on a coach for an hour. I'm going to tell you right now, if I had to pick between either of those, I'm going to pay the $3,500, not the $100. 
the average price for a business coach uh, that is ICF certified is about $250 an hour. And I think that's way undervalued. Um, I would think that if you're not paying $250 an hour or more, you're probably not getting good value. Um, speaking to your point, Jack, um, I, I'm not really familiar with, I've not seen that done, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Um, I, I'm aware of organizations that have board of advisors, but uh, not in a formal coaching context. So, so the question is, if we would get a coach, would it be for the top salespeople or for who? The first person that needs to be a coach is the boss of the organization. The higher up you go, the more effective it's going to be. And then you filter down from there. If you're going to, if, if you're going to have a coach or coaches go into an organization and work with salespeople, okay, train all of them. But the boss still needs to be coached. That's a fine question. Others? Jill's coming down the aisle. That means I'm done. Thank you very much.